Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Dick Broderson, and I'm excited to welcome back Guy Spear to the show. Guy, thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule to speak with me and the TIP community here today. Well, Stig, your excitement is only exceeded by my excitement. I'm super excited to uh, come back on your show. It's been a long time. And uh, for the listener, I just want you to know that I just took a, a while to read through Stig's notes that he took. And he's got the most extraordinary set of notes. Um, the reason why this podcast is so great is that Stig does the work. And so thank you for having me, Stig. Wow, what an what an introduction! Uh, I don't even know if I should edit that out. I think it's going to my head if if people hear you say that, guy. <laughs> it's from the bottom of my heart for the for the for the listener or viewer. Uh, I had missed the notes, so we were about to start the interview, and then Stig says, "Well, is just before we go live, is there anything that in the notes that you can't don't think you don't like or give comment on?" And um, and then I didn't realize that there were questions there, so we just took five minutes. Stig probably made himself a coffee. And I'm just really impressed. So, so wow. it's just genuine and from the bottom of my heart. And so don't cut it out. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, give me an excuse to to do the humble break. So, so guy, yes, I won't I won't take it out. But let's uh, let's jump right into the first question here. So, yeah. um, I've heard you say that envy can be a good feeling to have. And you used it actually whenever you set out your journey learning more about Warren Buffett. And I wanted to mention this, uh, not just because of this cheeky comment I can now make about Warren Buffett, who has said that you should not feel envy because it's the only sin you can't have fun with. Uh, but I wanted to start this interview by asking this question. Since in investing and in every other uh, walk of life, uh, envy is an emotion we all we all experience, even though it's a feeling we, we might feel as people we shouldn't shouldn't be feeling in the first place. Um, yeah. How... Yeah, how have you used envy as a positive force in your life? You know, uh, and uh, I thank you for a spectacular question, Stig. And um, you know, I get really excited. So I, I've so you know, I feel like just about anything I can think of that I learn that's valuable, I realize at some point that uh, Warren and Charlie already knew it, and so there's nothing. But I, I so I get excited when I think that I've discovered something or I've come across something that maybe Warren and Charlie don't know or have not expressed. And for me, I think that this might be one nugget. And um, it, so it starts from a really valuable psychological idea for those of us who've sat and spent time uh, with psychotherapists, which is that our emotions are a clue to action. And there's this famous case of Phineas Gage who had this accident where a steel rod went through his head and it destroyed the part of his brain, it seems, that enabled him to feel emotion. And what happened is that he was pretty normal in spite of recovering from that pretty awful injury uh, and with a certain part of his brain destroyed. But what they discovered over time is that the lack of emotion that he felt uh, made it far more difficult to take important decisions in life. And so um, our emotions are a guide to action. We evolved, as we know, over millions of years. And so we can look at any particular aspect of our body and say, why is it there? And just to give a mechanical example, I've discovered, because I'm here with a broken, a healing broken arm, that there are many aspects to the design of our body, which are kind of like crumple zones. We have evolved to have crumple zones so that, you know, if something happens, your head is protected. So there, there is so much functionality to the way we evolved. And so the emotions are not just something that sit there separate to our lives and separate to our missions. They're actually central and we can kind of discover what their purpose is. So uh, I, the easiest one to kind of talk about is the emotion of anger. The emotion of anger is, um, uh, in its core, as best I understand it, is my boundaries have been violated and I need to do something to reset this. I either need to um, deter the action that, that violated my boundaries or I have to protect myself or I have to do... So there's kind of like... So when we feel anger, now in our complex world, we can do something stupid like punch the person back or engage in vindictive behavior 
But if we interpret the emotion of anger right, then we're going to build our defenses, we're going to deter in an intelligent way. So envy. Um, what it's, I don't think that it's, it's kind of shallow to just dismiss an emotion as a sin. The, it's, far better is to say, well, what is actually going on here? Let's try and understand and uncover this. And so, you know, I have a Mexican wife. And so she has often in early in our marriage, our marriage experienced the emotion of jealousy. And jealousy is far easier to understand in terms of people. It's like, that's the person I intend to mate with, or I am mating with, and I don't want your genes mixing up and um, uh, muddying the waters. I just want my genes and this person's genes to mix. Very, very protective emotion. Um, and I can't claim, and I certainly am not a, a qualified psychologist, but, but if I try and unpick the emotion of envy for myself, the emotion of envy says that person has something that I deserve to have in my life. That I don't think that we feel the emotion of envy for something that is unreachable. I don't think that the people who come into the presence of the queen or people who come into the presence of uh, Ronaldinho or another soccer player, they feel envy because the skills are just so great and are so unattainable, you feel awe. You feel awe to be in their presence. Uh, you know, we, but if you're Djokovic and you're playing um, Roger Federer or you see Federer, now Djokovic might feel envy for Federer. Why? Because he knows he has the capacity for the greatness that Federer has. And so it seems to me that what we need to do with envy, now if you take the Djokovic-Federer uh, rivalry, what does Djokovic do with that envy? Now, if he, if he, if he does what uh, the ice skating woman did, I'm, I'm not going to remember the name. She went and stabbed her rival, Nancy Kerrigan. She went and stabbed Nancy Kerrigan. That is a terrible misdirection of the emotion of envy. But, but the emotion really says, wow, I'm feeling this envy actually because I am a genuine rival to this person and I need to go to work on, be, on, on, on maybe making that a reality I think that is a very useful um, uh, use of envy. The point being that if we take our envy and sweep it under the rug, we're not going to get the benefit. You know, as we all know, there's no point going to our angry spouse uh, or an angry child and say, you're angry, but you shouldn't feel angry. Sweep it under the rug. We're not dealing with it. But if we say, let's take the anger out, let's unpack it, let's understand why you're angry, and let's try and think about what the best way to deal with your anger is. Is it writing a letter of complaint? Is it suing? Is it deciding not to have the person in your life ever again? Similar with envy. And so that, I hope it's not, I didn't take too long to explain it. But when you look at it that way, it's just extraordinarily powerful. And I think that what's so exciting about that is that, well, I'll give you just one other idea, Stig, which was just so valuable for me. And I learned it um, with a meditation and mindfulness coach. Um, in which she said, when you feel these strong emotions, you know, if you say, oh, that's one of the seven deadly sins, no point doing that. There's no fun in it. We've dismissed it. Instead, take that little emotion and, and you know, strap it into the car with you. Don't let it in the front seat. Definitely don't put it in the driver's seat, but stick it in the back seat, have it strap in and take it with you. You know, invite it in and have a conversation with it and see where you go with that emotion. That's where the spice of life is. I think I've almost belabored the point, so I'll stop there, Stig. I hope that's helpful. I think that's that's very helpful and, and very insightful. And thank you for, sh for sharing, Guy. Um, you know, one thing I, I always, fr from studying your work and from listening to, your, to the interviews with you, it's always, it always amazes me how you can turn something that is seemingly bad into something that that's good that's that's help you that helps you grow as a person oh, um, that's, so oh, that's, thank you that's very kind that's i would tell kind. you that when i used to live in manhattan i had a place on west 67th street and a time when barnes and noble still had stores over all over new york city there was a barnes and noble store at the end of my street and i had made very good friends with the self-help section and um yeah if i i i i, I would just take just to do a kind of a part b to that question, 
uh, is, you know, I had the great privilege and opportunity to join a lecture, a group of students in a lecture that Charlie Munger was giving to the group of students. And um, he talked about adversity uh, in the lecture. And he said something so simple and so powerful. He basically said, look, all of you, it is a given. There's no question. It's part of the human condition. You're going to have to deal with adversity. You're going to have terrible setbacks, every single one of you. But don't look on it badly because each one of those setbacks will be an opportunity for you to behave well and to and to engage in the behavior that will enable you later on to deserve your success. And uh, I, I just such a kind of powerful and you know it's this Carol Dweck idea of a growth mindset. And you know life isn't what happens to you it's what you do with what happens to you and we are very much in the driver's seat and um unfortunately stig it still doesn't mean that tragedy and adversity won't befall us but rather be in the driving seat and we are in the driving seat if we can just see that so if i if i can make a segue if you if you allow me guy i would say from one wise person uh to the next uh because i wanted to talk about uh the essays of a warren buffett yeah. Um, this is, uh, this is one of my favorite books. Um, and what is really fascinating about the book is that you can really tell how much Warren Buffett has involved as an investor, uh, whether it's his thoughts on investing, governance, acquisitions, or whatever it might be. And if you continue on that train of thought, uh, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger have said that the difficulty lies not so much in developing new ideas, but escaping the old. So... I can't help but wonder, Guy, uh, which ideas uh, for you and perhaps more recently have been the hardest for you to escape as an investor? Yeah. <laughs> Just take me to the painful places, Stig. I mean, um, you know, uh, I, I came from a world of venture investment banking and not a very good end of it. And you know, I discovered Warren Buffett and I just felt this. It's very few times I felt such a powerful motivation to want to become a part of a world that I was not a part of. And I, I gave an enormous amount of myself to make that happen in terms of uh, energy and desire and willpower. Uh, and so, you know, I didn't realize that in doing that, I was I was pounding some stuff in that should be unlearned more quickly. There was a period in my in my investing career when I genuinely believed that all I had to do for the rest of my life was find one newspaper towns the way Warren Buffett had in the Washington Post and the Buffalo News and other places. And I'd I sit and study Gannett, but I'd also study companies like Shibstead in uh, Norway and Neue uh, Zürcher Zeitung here in Switzerland. And I really thought I had I owned shares in a company called Eddie Press, which was in the west of Switzerland. And um, and then just to go right to your point, um, I, I am going to the Berkshire meeting and there's this wonderful, wonderful uh, investor who's extraordinarily wealthy, I suspect at this point, who lives on an island in Madison, Wisconsin called Steve Waldman. Steve, I hope you don't mind that I've called your name out. I hope you're doing well. And he sits down with me quietly and he says, you know, I think that, and this is like in 2000 and five, six. He says, you know, this company Apple is really interesting because uh, Microsoft and Wintel, Windows and uh, Intel are all kind of focused on text and word processing and very simple email. And these guys at Apple, they're all about graphic design and they're all about this beautiful experience. And he said, if I think about it, where's the world going? The world is certainly going towards images and moving images, and they keep bringing out these nice-looking products. This was way before the iPhone, and um, you know, this was like you know many thousands of percentage points before now. And what do I do? I go, yeah, but that's tech, and I don't do tech. And by the way, Warren and Charlie don't do tech. And I think that one of the biggest sins that I committed is that I didn't. I didn't I wasn't willing to investigate. I mean, this is not sort of like me reading about in the newspapers or some guy who's not from the uh, investing community that I respect who's talking to me about it. This happened at the Berkshire meeting. I saw B Steve Wallman at the Berkshire meeting and he's sitting and talking to me about Apple and he's, he's not a promotional guy. He's a quiet, 
thoughtful guy. He's he's very much he's he's very much in the mold of the Norman Rockwell investor that Warren and Charlie do so well, you know. And um, and then there was the Berkshire meeting where we discovered that that Berkshire had bought Apple, and it was a very painful meeting for me because because Warren had demonstrated that he had unlearned the lessons of, for example, one newspaper towns. But I had not unlearned the lessons. I was still pursuing a kind of a dogma that that was silly. And it took me another two or three years to get over it. And I think that I'm still getting over it. So, uh, you know, it, it's kind of difficult. <laughs> but, you know, we just said it is going to be. Nobody said that this is going to be easy. But for me, that's a huge, huge lesson. And, uh you know, I know that we're going to get onto it, but that's why I keep an extremely open mind to crypto, and I'm super curious and interested when, uh, you know, members of your team or members of my conference become interested in something that that supposedly is not a smart investment. Because where are the good ideas going to come from? They're not going to come from just continuously pounding out the old ideas. So, um, so that was extremely painful for me. I'm still in the process of unlearning those ideas and. You know, when I came to the world of Berkshire Hathaway and, quote, value investing or intelligent investing, it already had gone through a transition because there were people uh, like, I, I forget his name, uh, but the Mr. Geiger counter, a very successful investor, but who would only buy net nets. You know, the world had moved on from net nets, but the world was still in a place where you would look at cash flows and income statements. But I have not moved on. Or have a difficulty with moving on to a world in which you have to look at total addressable market, lifetime value of the customer, you know, businesses where you're going to invest a very high amount in your profitable customers and appear unprofitable while you're actually very profitable, but it's just hidden. So I'm still unlearning those ideas. And, and I'm kind of, um, you know, I take my hat off to those people, value investors, smart investors, who've learned who've who've learned that the cutting edge of smart investing is in that direction so guy um let's let's talk perhaps a bit about bitcoin and let's not uh because <laughs> <laughs> and perhaps you can transition into that later uh but you said that you do not agree with Charlie Munger that bitcoin is rat poison and you also said that it's likely not an investable asset for you and yeah. I guess one part of the, the audience might be happy that we're we're not at least not yet talking about Bitcoin. The other one say yes, guys here, and it's it's good. We can talk about real news, one newspaper towns. Uh, but I, I really wanted to add another layer of reflection on this question because I remember reading that Charlie Munger didn't read fiction, and I remember how that made me rethink my own reading habits. I guess in a in a clumsy attempt to to clone one of my great heroes, uh, perhaps a bit too much. Um, so then I think I think of you, and I know you've been in the space for a long time. And at, like you mentioned before, you um, you revere Charlie Munger and, and 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 Warren Buffett for that matter. But I also heard you talking about how reading fiction is right for you. Yeah. So I yeah. guess my question is partly about the value of reading fiction, uh, which I know you have a very interesting take on, but perhaps more importantly about escaping your heroes and and how do we know which which habits we should clone. Yes. Yes. Because we're not going to become good investors by eating peanut brittle and drinking Coca Colas or cherry cokes all day long, even though it's fun to do. So isn't yes. that? And I think that there is a a natural progression when we get a hero so in a certain way when we get a hero we don't really choose them it's almost like they choose us or there's this two-way thing that happens and then the first thing that happens is that we do want to clone everything that they do because we don't know what we should and what we should not clone so i think that the early stages of having a hero is that we wear the same clothes as them we go to the same bars, same restaurants, eat the same food, you name it. And I think that there's nothing wrong with that. And there's almost like there's a period of figuring it out. So, you know, and, and then at first, and maybe some of those habits, you know, you try cherry coke and realize you actually like it, you know? Whereas by contrast for me, when I, when I had the charity lunch with Warren Buffett, uh, and, you know, and I ordered Coca-Cola, 
Diet Coke in my case, but I actually wish I'd ordered a <laughs> bottle of wine and had a nice wine. Um, but that's okay. But then that process, I think the process of figuring out what is it that I should be cloning, and it starts off with discarding the things that are certainly not necessary, like eating the same food. or uh, And then over time, it becomes harder because there'll be some aspects. And I think that there's learning that takes place. So, wow, Warren Buffett invests in uh, branded goods companies. I'm going to look at all the branded goods companies in the world, and I'm going to start try and understand them as well as Warren Buffett. So that's way far away from, uh, let's say, um, you know, cloning what Warren Buffett wears or cloning his his food habits. But then, you know, we, we, you know, I in my case, for example, insurance. I was looking carefully into insurance companies. I think that at some point I realized I am just not there, and I'm not really going to understand the sector, and so. Maybe I should not try and clone Warren Buffett in uh, insurance companies. So what am I trying to say? And then we get to a place, I think, where you just go, I'm not Warren Buffett. And actually, I've learned so much from him. So there's kind of the life cycle of the hero in the, in the follower of the hero. And long story short, it's a complex growth process by which we acquire knowledge and then look at the knowledge we've acquired and decide what is important and to keep and what parts are not important and to discard. And, um, you know, and in the process, I think that what happens is that we discover that you know, we want it to be exactly like our hero. And then as we discard certain things, we realize actually it's okay not to be exactly like our hero. And actually I'm a different person. So you know, in the, my, the simple example, I do like red wine, and I know that Warren's never going to be as interested in red wine as I do, and that's okay. And that doesn't mean that I can't uh, clone him in other ways. And um, you know, I, I really respect the investors who say, "Yeah, we we are huge fans of Warren Buffett, but he really doesn't get the tech space. He really doesn't get cloud computing, and he doesn't realize that." the Geico of this generation is XYZ cloud computing company. And yes, it appears to have a high valuation in the same way that when he was buying Geico, it appeared to have a high valuation. And that's okay because I'm kind of discarding that aspect of my hero. I was too slavishly following Warren Buffett to be able to engage in that kind of independence of thought. And so just to come to Charlie Munger and reading, I think again, there's, there's, you know, I think that looking inside, there, there are clues. So what happened to me with Charlie on reading fiction is that that irked me. I can't say it really annoyed me. I can't say it lost. I lost sleep over it. But I kind of just said, that does not sit well with me. Yeah. Now, I have to say, I think that Charlie's a, more, a far more voracious reader than probably pretty much every other person on the planet. And what I heard on the last call with him is that when he was young, he read a lot of fiction. So it's not like he's it's not like he's saying, I've never read fiction and I'm not interested in fiction. He's saying, I've got my fill of fiction. I've got I've gone beyond, you know, I, I know that when I took up swimming, there was this experience curve. Like every time you double the distance you've swam, you get that you you get that little bit better. And initially, when you swim a lot and you haven't swum very much, that you've got a lot of gains that you can get really quickly. And then the longer, you know, the, then you get go down the experience curve. It's very possible that Charlie Munger says, I've read so much fiction that I just don't think there are a lot of gains I can get from it. And that's what I think he's saying. And I think that the reason why it irked me in part is because I just don't, there, there are many fiction books that I have just not read. And I've actually decided that I don't want to end my life if not that not to positively am I, but I don't want to get to the end of my life and not have read certain works of fiction, certain classics, which I set myself the task to read. For all I know, Charlie's read all of those. I, I decided I'm not going to die without having read War and Peace. I'm not going to die without having read David Copperfield, which is what I'm reading right now. I'm not going to die without having read The Magic Mountain. And I would say that each one of those books has, and I'm going yeah, through them very slowly, has given me an enormous amount. I don't know how helpful I've been, Stig. I think you've been immensely, immensely helpful. So, Guy, one thing we uh, we talked about before we started the recording 
Um, and it seems like so many conversations are going in that direction these days. But I was that was talking about uh, crypto and yeah. and some of the struggles of you know having having people like Charlie Wonga who have been, I guess, even more vocal than, than Warren Buffett about his his dislike for that. And you know, it, it was something I shared with you that it's been challenging for for Preston and, and, and me, and still is to some extent. Um, making that sh that shift, and I don't know if we're making a shift. I, I don't necessarily think they're mutually exclusive, but a lot of people do see it as being mutually exclusive. If you do hold Bitcoin, you can't be a value investor, and vice versa. And and one of the things to, to throw it over to you was that you said that you you have these uh, the conferences, the Value X, and you said that a lot of people are talking about it. So I, I can't help but but ask you, Guy, how do you think about it? And and, yeah. and what about the community that you surround yourself with? Yeah, what's being said? I think that I, I would be missing out on one of the biggest benefits of my ValueX community if I did not pay attention to those members of the community who are talking about cryptocurrencies and uh, Bitcoin. And I'm going to name three names that may not be famous, but they're, they're, they're big names for me because they've taught me so much. Uh, and they're all members of my community. One is a guy called Chris Detweiler, and another guy is called Vitaly Rubstein, and the third one is called Ninad Shinde. And we've had um, uh, group calls on crypto, and one of you know, the earlier calls was simply, um, you know, what is crypto? And then there've been uh, subsequent calls, which is kind of different strategies around crypto. Um, these are some of the smartest members of my community, my community, of our community. And they're all value investors and they're all intelligent investors and they're all thoughtful people. And you know, I, I think you've heard me say it, but I feel like I wanna say it with emphasis. One of the dumbest things in the world would be to, to take somebody that I know is smart and not listen to them. And one of the dumbest things in the world would be to say, uh, I'm not going to listen to them because I disagree with them. I have my preconceived idea, or I have my idea about what this thing is, and therefore their opinion doesn't have any validity. And it would be utterly destructive to say they no longer have, quote, a home in our community of, an intelli of intelligent investors. So, um, uh, you know, I, I don't want to. So now I, let's just go to the other end of it. Let's just let's just sit for a second with Charlie Munger and Rat Poison Squared, and um, uh, let's talk about. I don't know. One example would be the California Gold Rush. Imagine that you and I, Stig, are members of the same family, and we have I don't know some very successful farm or other traditional business that one might have had around the California Gold Rush. And, um, you know, vast numbers of our family are running off because they want to find gold in the gold rush. I think, you know, and let's just imagine that we're in, in our 80s and 90s and we have great grandchildren. I, I don't think it's irrational to say the gold rush is rat poison squared. You're going to, because if you're looking, I mean, I, Charlie must have 30, 40, 50 grandchildren. I don't know how many. And if you tell him we got a world in which every single one of them is going to dabble in Bitcoin, I think it's very, or in, in crypto in general, I think you're going to have far more losses there and far more broken lives than good lives. So who is the audience that Charlie Munger is addressing? Charlie Munger is addressing a, his own grandchildren for sure and a general public. And he's addressing a general public in which Many people are approaching the world of crypto probably in not a very smart way. And he's probably absolutely right for them that uh, they're far more likely to lose a lot than they are to make their fortune on a hill. But I don't think that I'm certain that Charlie Munger has friends at Sequoia and at uh, other of the leading venture firms. No doubt in my mind, although I can't confirm it. Would he turn to one of those people and say that actually your whole investment area in crypto, your work to put together the same company Coinbase, that's rat poison squared and don't do it and don't touch it? I don't think he would say that. I think quite the opposite. And so um, let's just remember the people in my community talking about uh, crypto are not, 
um, you know, meme chasers. They are very, very smart, thoughtful people. They understand that many, many games are rigged. They understand that the, the job of the poker player more than anything else is to certain way play in the right table. And the world of crypto is throwing up, you know, so many tables to play at. And maybe there's only 1% of those tables that are worth playing at. Uh, but I think that the people that I know are very likely to find their place at those tables. And so it's completely consistent, I think, to say that Charlie Munger is right. For, for the vast majority of his audience, it is Rat Poison Squared. But that for the people in my community, it's not Rat Poison Squared. It's an amazingly interesting place to learn and look. And actually, I, I, I would go one step farther. I mean, we, I, mean I, I think it's Balaji Srin, Srinivansan. I hope I'm saying his name right. But he just goes by the name of Balaji. And I, I've listened to podcasts with him with uh, around Bitcoin. It is Web 3.0. It, it is utterly revolutionary what um, crypto does. And so, um, you know, yeah. Yes, so yeah. Charlie Munger is not wrong. But, but you and I... I think that that and others are would be very stupid not to pay close attention. So, uh, guy, continuing, um, continuing this discussion about heroes. Yeah. Um, oh, you don't want to stay on Bitcoin and. Uh... <laughs> oh, I, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like for the audience, I feel like it's a sensitive issue for you. Uh, because it's kind of dividing people, and I just want to—I want to try once more. I hope it doesn't make you too uncomfortable. Oh Stig. yeah, yeah, yes. So, so I want to stay with it. Forgive me, Stig, just for a second before you move on to the next topic. Is that I'm not saying to anyone in the audience that, or just to you, Stig, that you need to go and find the latest guy who's on a Dogecoin craze and debate with him the benefits or the disbenefits of Dogecoin or anything else. Um, but when somebody you respect mm -hmm. is saying something that's very, very different to what you think is true about the world, then that is a time to get very curious and to get very open-minded. And it's funny because let's just go back to my conversation with Steve Wallman about Apple. What did I do? I closed my mind to the idea that he was sharing with me. And just to be clear, I was not talking to some taxi driver in the street who was giving me the tip to buy Apple because everybody's buying Apple. I was talking to a very, very intelligent, thoughtful guy at the Berkshire meeting. And he's saying, I think that this company, Apple, is really interesting. In 2005, six is what I remember the time frame. I closed my mind because I had a very fixed idea about what smart investing was. And I just said, yeah, but I don't do tech. So now we fast forward to today. And in a similar way, you know, let's just name a name that you know well, a guy that I respect enormously for many reasons. Your partner, Preston Pish, says Bitcoin. What do I do? Do I close my mind and say, this guy has gone off the deep end? Or do I say, this is not some guy, some taxi driver. Forgive me all taxi drivers, because now I'm maligning taxi drivers. He's somebody who's friends with Stick Broderson. He's somebody who's interviewed some of the smartest people in the world. He has flown um, helicopters for the US military. He has led groups of people. He is a thoughtful, smart guy. What I need to do is drop my blinkers and pay attention. And I urge the audience to do that. And that does not mean that, that, that Preston and I tomorrow are going to see eye to eye and agree on everything about Bitcoin. But he is seeing a slice of reality that I am not seeing. And I need to get super curious to understand what he is seeing. And uh, it shouldn't divide a community of intelligent investors. We should be, get super curious and interested in why we're seeing things from different angles. I hope that was helpful. Yeah, um, I, I think that was that was very helpful. Um, and, and and you are right, guy. It, it is a sensitive topic for me and and for the community in so many ways. 
Can I stay um, with Bitcoin and crypto just one one bit longer? Because there's a question that was in there, and I'm afraid you'll leave it, and then we won't come back to it. And I'm looking forward to getting on to other topics. But the, you, you've also you wrote in there that I've said that for me, crypto is uninvestable. And you know, I, I had one of our investors who asked me a question uh, about whether he should invest in one big chunk or whether he should divide it up into four smaller chunks and time cost average. And best last time I checked, the evidence shows just put it all in one big chunk. But I said what that evidence does not take into account is the psychology of the investor doing it. And um, so, you know, how do you define your circle of competence? How do you keep yourself on the straight and narrow? And for different people, it's different things. And I know more than one highly intelligent investors, value investors that I deeply respect, who have said around crypto, I am investing in Coinbase, or I am invest putting 1% of my fund into Bitcoin. And they're kind of like, have a different approach uh, to how they want to assess risk and how they want to evaluate investments. And where I come from is I'm saying to myself, I want to restrict myself to assets that generate some kind of cash return to the investment. And I'm only going to live in that world. And I want to live in that world. So I say, I pay close attention, have enormous respect for the people who are engaging in crypto. But it's not so, because I think that if I allow myself to do that, there may be many things that are really quite stupid that I will also allow myself to do. So those are kind of the bowling with curtains that I put up for myself. And I don't think I'm inconsistent on the one hand saying crypto is utter revolutionary. There are people who are doing crypto who are doing very interesting things, but it's not investable for me. And I don't plan to invest anytime soon in the same way that I'm extraordinarily grateful for all the biotechnology research that takes place, for all the biotech companies that are taken public, for all the stuff that's going on there that I benefit from or people I know benefit from with new drugs and therapeutics but it's not an investable area for me and uh, and no problem. And and I don't think that those people who are heavily engaged in crypto should feel so upset at Charlie Munger that he calls it rat poison squared or that he's not investing in it. In the same way that the guys who are doing biotech are not upset that those of us who want to invest in banking stocks are not looking at biotech. They understand that the world is big and there are plenty of different ways to approach it. Thank you for listening to me, Stig. Back to you. <laughs> no, I... I I like it, and and it, w- it was so refreshing. So before we hit record, and 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 to have a discussion about it, and I you, I was you know crying my heart out. I don't know if I was, but you know, <laughs> talking to you about some of the struggles. So so what what happened um, was that we we back in April 2015, we wrote a book, uh, Preston and I together about Bitcoin, and we we couldn't ex- we, none of us really understood what it was all about because it was just it sounded so odd, and. Um, and and then what what quickly hap- happened around that time was we read this book about uh, I think it's called Money Master the Game yeah. by um, by Tony Robbins uh, who I also know have been an inspiration for um, for you and and someone who was also divisive uh, to to a lot of people yeah and and he kept on talking about this guy named uh, Red Dalio and I'd never heard about the dude and he kept on talking about how he was like the best investor who was fantastic and he the way he thought about money was just you know. The all weather portfolio, that's what you needed to do. And I I listened to it and uh, I was flying overseas. So I had a plenty of time on my hands. And he had this long talk about how you should invest in gold. A small portion, we should invest in gold because monetary systems break down. You know, they, they always have all currencies have broken down at some point in time. And that's just what history would, would tell you. And I remember, and now we're talking about the heroes, I remember thinking it doesn't make any sense because I've learned from Warren Buffett himself, that you should not invest in gold. And I couldn't understand how someone like Tony Robbins would endorse Redalio. And then whenever I finally got Wi-Fi, I looked Redalio up and he seemed as legit as they come. And so I was like, why, why are people talking about it? And so um, so, so the challenge that Preston and I were, were facing was that we became really, really interested uh, in Bitcoin. We, we bought into it and... Uh, as soon as we started talking about it, we could just see a, like a cascade of bad reviews, and we could see some really, really bad things happening from the from the community. 
And uh, I had many long talks with Preston about how how do we do it? Because at that point in time, it wasn't just, uh, like we used to say, it wasn't just Preston and me sitting in the garage. Uh, you know, it was like we had we had people working for us, and and like my, more, one of my big concerns was that uh, I'm 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 going too long on this. One of my big concerns was that do we need to close down? If if we if we believe in this thing and, and we both talk about that we invest in it, um, do we need to? Does it mean that that we're going to blow up? Does it mean that people lose trust in us because we're taught that it's it's rat poison? We can't we can't talk about it. And I remember, I remember uh, I was rereading the the education of a value investor, and you talked a lot about authenticity in that book. And I, I remember having discussions with Preston about it and myself, my wife, and like it, there was something that was very, very, it had a big impact on me in terms of you have to be transparent about what you do. And I probably said this 10 or 15 times on the show that I'm invested, even though I'm not a part of a Bitcoin show. But like, how, how do you how do you convey that? Um, should you, could you compromise on being invested in something like that? How, Running a business is it a bad dis business? Is to talk about it? Are your principles then for sale if you don't talk enough about it? Like it has been a very troubling thing. So uh, back to you. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. No, oh, I oh. appreciate those thoughts, and I don't think that you should feel uncomfortable with them because I think that they are, um, you know, you you are being authentic and you are being real with me. I just want to reassure you of that, and I think that when you do that, you come up against some more powerful constraints, which are the constraints of the way the world works. So, you know, and, and so those are, those are far more powerful and far more difficult, if probably impossible to overcome. And I think that what comes up for me is that um, you were actually faced with a choice of um, whether you want to be in the investment business or in the publishing business. And um, the it is natural that you know, it is a it is a problem for anyone who's an investor who writes that the things that your readers want to read about are the ideas that are popular at the time, but the things that make the best investments are the ideas that are not popular at the time. And so, how do you square that circle? And I think it's very hard. I think that that's why, you know, many people who've dabbled in both have to at some point to decide: Am I an investor or am I a publisher? And um, or you make the decision that uh, Manual of Ideas John Miljevic has taken, which is he is a publisher in his public persona, and is in his private persona he is a very um, he's he's an investor, and and but that means that if you take a decision like that, then at least you're not you're not making a compromise. You're saying, look, we're publishers, we're publishing what will make our publication successful. Uh, and uh, or alternative, you say we're investors. That's where we make our money, and the publishing is a sideline, and we don't care if it's successful or not. And um, so I don't. I think that you were faced with a with a kind of like a difficult. You cannot square that circle. You just have to look and say which do I want to be. Well said. Um, yeah, well said, uh, guy. So let me uh, let me. Let me transition back to the <laughs> to the to the interview here. Our plan, <laughs> Our plan, yes. But hey, some of the best conversations are whenever they're they're not planned. So exactly, I don't, exactly. I'm not bad about it at all. But you, and I guess this is also a good segue because as a teenager, I remember having my my heroes, whether it was in sports or in business, and I distinctly remember that I naively thought that I would never have a care in the world if I were that person. Yeah. And of course, as we grow up, we realize that everyone has their own problems. Yeah. And perhaps Redalio, we talked about him before. He perhaps he says it best with his quote that the best thing you can hope for here in life is to struggle well. Yes. So I can't help but ask you, guy, how do you struggle well in life and in business? <laughs> exactly. It's a wonderful, wonderful question. And I hope that um so one of my children. Uh, texted me yesterday. She's about to join us late today, and um, uh, she told me that she has become a vegan. But at the same time, we're not a vegan family, and uh, you know, there's a kind of a Mexican mom expectation that you eat the food that the mother 
puts on the table for you. And so how is she going to square that circle? And something that I told, said to my daughter at the end of a long uh, conversation, actually texting to each other because she's still at school on WhatsApp, is I said, if you, if you stay, if you, if you, if you push, if you be, if you're a hundred percent vegan and alienate your family, you will have lost. If you drop the veganism and just make your family happy, family harmony, you will have also lost. And I think that the happy ground is to struggle with those, those two contradictions and to find, just try and find that middle way. And, you know, I was kind of telling her, let's have the struggle. And then we continued in debates over what, you know, whether, whether animals are um, uh, slaughtered in a humane way here in, here in Switzerland. And, uh, and I kind of came out and said, you know, I actually don't care if I agree with you or disagree with you. I just care that we continue to have the conversation. So there was one struggle. And I would tell you that I found it very interesting through almost 20 years of marriage to my wife, how I think that the places where we see the world differently are actually the places where we're the strongest because we have stereo vision. We have two different views of the same thing. And if we if I occupy one side, one position, and my wife occupies another, and now we seek to understand each other, not to move ourselves to the same point, to occupy our two different points, then there's a power in that. And actually, the biggest problems my wife and I faced is, is when, when we see things exactly the same way, because then there's no stereo vision. So in my relationship with my children, relationship with my wife, so in my family, I think that struggle is a key part. And what came up for me with my daughter as well in this conversation is there's this famous story in the Old Testament that um, uh, uh, Jacob struggles with the angel. And in a certain way, it's a metaphor with, for life. If you're not struggling, you're not alive. And if you're not straight, in this case, the angel or maybe a messenger or representative of God or something like that, and so uh, I just think it's, first of all, it's a reassurance because uh, many people want to give the impression of effortless success or once you succeed, there is no struggle. And I think that, if, you know, to reassure the listeners of this program, myself, you, if you're in a struggle, you're probably doing the right thing. That's where you should be. And that's where you get stronger. And that's where your best life is lived. I think that, you know, just to me, myself, um, early on, um, I struggled a lot with, uh, you know, uh, sort of like pure um, absolute numbers as a measure of success, whether it's return numbers or assets under management or measures of net worth. And um, I think that, you know, again, the, the answer was not to sweep it under the rug and the answer was not to make it into an idol and worship it. But to struggle with that, to be able to bring up in conversation when people say, well, do you want to grow? And instead of saying, no, I don't want to grow, or yes, I do want to grow, say, well, I struggle with that because I see the, you know, there's a, I'm trying to dissect what's going on with me. I want to grow partly because I'm a narcissist, but partly because I think my business is subscale. Uh, and, you know, so that process of figuring out the truth is not something that happens because we have a dream one night. It happens because we struggle. Today, I, I struggle with something different, which is kind of scary, is that, you know, if you're under the age of 48, somebody, I think it was David Perel, I've been reading, he's a wonderful no, internet no. presence. He said that if you're under 48, then you're, in a, you're a second billionaire. In terms of the number of seconds you have le left in your life, based on your life expectancy, you're a second billionaire. And I'm not a second billionaire. And so one of the things that I struggle with is um, how do I make uh, the most of my time left on the planet, which is probably less than half of my full lifespan, which is um, a scary thought. And another thing that I struggle with, I think I've you know, there, there's no chance that I will die the richest person on the planet. And there's no chance that I will die with the person with the highest rate of return on the planet. Uh, and those are stupid things to aim for because, you know, the famous expression, um, you know, this rich man died and how much money did he leave behind? Well, he left all of it behind is the answer. Um, so, uh, but I think that what really excites me is this concept of social capital. Uh, so, 
you know, a big financial balance sheet, but having everybody hate you is a terrible outcome. Even a big financial balance sheet and having the world be neutral to you is a terrible outcome. I'd like to, 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 to get through the next 20, 30 years of my life having many institutions and individuals who count feel like I've been a positive presence in the world. And that means you know, paying my taxes, making sure that the investments that I, the companies that I invest in pay their taxes, investing in the communities around us. I get, interestingly, Stig, I now get less inspired by businesses that earn super high returns than by businesses that reinvest many of those returns such that they don't look like they're making any money. And that was one of the reasons why I think so many of us missed Apple. There's that famous, not Apple, sorry, Amazon. There's that famous comment, a video clip that's been replayed many times where Steve Ballmer says, well, at some point, Amazon's got to make money. Well, what Steve Ballmer didn't realize is that Amazon was actually very, very profitable in many of its businesses, but they were reinvesting in massive ways and all sorts of things. So for the first time, and I'm embarrassed Stig, that it's the first time for me. I am, you know, there's employee directed donations taking place at our small investment firm, meaning this is not Guy Spear wakes up one day and thinks that XYZ is a good uh, place to give money. And it's not a group decision. It's going to each individual employee and saying, you have access to a certain part of our charitable donation budget, and it's your exclusive decision where it goes. Uh, why? Because I want them to, re they will invest or they will make those donations uh, that is company money that's going out to institutions that they care about in their communities. And then they become people in their communities who are valued. And then by extension, we are valued. So this idea that, and I guess, you know, it actually comes from, so Klaus Schwab is not just a pretty face running the World Economic Forum. At first, I didn't want to accept what he said, and I was very influenced Stig, by Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman says, just maximize your profits. The world will take care of everything else. Adam Smith 2.0. Uh, and it's a beautiful thought. And the way I translated that was, um, all I got to do as an investor, and all, all, I, all I have to do as an investor and CEOs is look for people who try to make the most money within the laws of the country that they're in. I'm obviously not looking for people to break the law but they just maximize their profits and the invisible hand takes care of everything else. And it, the first place I read it was with Klaus Schwab at the WEF where he said, no, that's not the way business works anymore. Businesses have to be, um, they, they, they have to look at stakeholder capitalism. Your shareholders are a stakeholder. Shareholders, capital's got to eat, as Tom Gaynor says. But your employees have to, your communities of your employees, your suppliers, the uh, the places of business, all of those places have to benefit, and and business has to exercise far more leadership than it has in the past. Um, so that's where those are the places where I struggle, if you like, today. Just going back to your question, which is a question about struggle. But um, if you're not struggling, you're not alive. You know, so enjoy the struggle. Find the struggle that you like. If you're good at soccer and you love soccer. I've been watching videos of Ronaldinho. Ronaldinho is this, I don't know if you've watched videos of him on YouTube. I have. I mean, you know what's so beautiful, Stig, about Ronaldinho is he, he does these moves and then he's got this look of utter boyish joy on his face as he's looking around his fellow players and did you see that? Did I actually do that? It is um, so awesome to see. And I can't remember where I brought Ronaldinho up but but you know if you're Ronaldinho play soccer if you're if you're Muhammad Ali box but find the struggle that's worthy to you so uh guy let's uh let's let's shift gears here um I had the privilege of uh, of speaking with a good friend Moniz Paprai uh from time to time and I remember discussing Sarity's growth properties with him uh, but my question is is not about this, the investment itself, but something uh, Manu said um, about the investment and about you. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll present the quote here. And so I'm trying to be more like Guy. And the number one skill to be a great investor is extreme patience. If yeah. you can derive tremendous pleasure from watching paint dry, you'll be a very wealthy man. <laughs> Just be in this meditative state 
watching that white wall. And once you can do that, then you're ready to hold Serotis for 20 years. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's amazing uh, what, what Monis can say. Uh, but I, I thought a lot about that. Um, not just because I'm I'm invested myself and with the volatility of Seritage, but but what it really led me to was the more profound thing to me at least, which was how much are you wired to be extremely patient, and how much, if if anything, is self-taught when it comes to patience. Nature or nurture, man, it's the eternal question. Um, well, obviously, you know, uh, I, I very much appreciate when anybody compliments me and I think that he paid me a very nice compliment and I appreciate it very much, uh, because we all appreciate being complimented. So thank you, Monish. Um, you know, uh, I, I, uh, Monish is a different, very different personality to my father, but people who have run successful businesses, I think have a bias to action you have to have a bias to action. If you don't have a bias to action, your business will most likely die. So um, Monish, who's been unlike me, who's had at least one very successful business be before he came an investor, has had a more significant challenge in terms of, of, of investing because he the very thing, the bias to action that you have in an operating business is one of the things you absolutely don't want when you have an investment business or if you're thinking about the world the way Charlie and Warren think about the world. But it's not a problem for Monish because he's completely and utterly up to the task. I, I Just to take a second for Monish and, and describe things that I see about Monish that maybe are not um, obvious is that I, I've never seen anybody who has a more powerful empirical sense, meaning that... <clears throat> You know, there's somebody that, that we were trying to get to recently, and we happen to know that this person wasn't opening their emails. And so that's somebody who's kind of shying away from reality. They don't want to deal with whatever messages those emails have. And then you have, uh, and, and so some people, reality is there, but they just don't want to see it. They're in denial of one form or another, or they may not be in denial. They just are not engaging with the reality that's in front of them. And what I've experienced with Monish time and again is that when he experiences ideas that are opposed to what he's doing, opposed to his fervently held beliefs, he he grasps them. He, there's an there's this quick and aggressive uh, avarice for knowledge and avarice for reality. And then when it, when he sees a fact about the world or a fact about himself, he jumps on it. And so what you see there is Monish realizing that he has a bias towards action and that when it comes to investing he needs to expunge that bias for action and that fact he does not ignore that fact it does not sit as an unopened email it's opened and it's been digested and you see that it's been digested because he's talking to you about it and so in a certain way he's pounding that lesson in for himself uh when it comes to me i think that in that regard i am extremely fortunate in many ways I am not the ideal mindset for an investor. And the reason why I say that is that I have strong emotions and strong emotions around investing far stronger than they, they would have to be to be really, really good. Uh, and that's just, that's no problem. I am happy to deal with that and happy to have my own makeup. But, you know, we're far better when we recognize that. So that is a place. And, and I don't think that I'm anywhere near as interested in games of chance as Warren and Charlie have been in their lives. And I think that actually still, if I were to just play more bridge, I would become better as an investor. Bridge is this fascinating combination of knowledge and chance that I don't play enough of. Um, but I have a very natural bias towards inaction. Uh, I have a very natural bias towards inaction because I have a slightly academic mindset and I love uh, you know, perusing things and thinking about things and I like reading and um, and then also because I am in a, I, I have maybe ADHD, I'm personally disorganized. And so it's hard for me to get to action. There's a book that was written, or at least it was an essay title. It's hard to change the world if you can't find your keys. And that kind of describes me pretty well. And I feel very lucky because I've got a group of people around me who help me with all of those things. But so I think that I just, you know, a bit like Asterix and Obelix, 
where um, Obelix fell into the tank of the of the special potion, so he definitely doesn't need any more. Uh, in that narrow sense of having a strong bias towards inaction, it's kind of like just I fell into the pot of inaction in my life. Uh, and so um, it's definitely nature, nature for me. And then if it comes to nurture, what part of patience or inaction and a bias towards inaction in your portfolio can be cultivated and those people who have a bias towards action? Well, I think that we will see Monish succeed handsomely with that desire to, to develop a, desire, a, a bias towards inaction. And I think that it's this strange thing in human psychology that once you truly acknowledge that you have uh, a bias or an issue or that there's something that is about you that is not part of what you want it to be, then you, you know, a problem well-defined is a problem half-solved. And so what you see in that Monish example is that Monish has defined the problem. And now he now he's all, he's more than half solved it because you know that you just to say, I have a bias for an action, for action, because I have been an entrepreneur and that bias is not helpful to me in business. Now you're going to figure out when when that bias to action gets triggered and when it's an appropriate action when it's not. Very insightful. Thank you, Guy. Um, thank you for, 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 for sharing your insights. You're, you're, it's almost like you're too kind. Every time I or Manish would pay you a compliment, you always, you, you always see how much you can send back. Uh, it's, uh, it's absolutely wonderful. And, and you make everyone feel so, so welcome in your presence. That's very kind. I want to tell you, I, I know you got another question, but I know I might forget this and I, know that it's valuable so i'm going to tell it to you because i've learned this from observing i'm not friends with charlie munger i've i monish has had many meals with charlie i'm i'm deeply envious of monish for having those meals unfortunately you know and i think that the the right way to play out that envy is to you know i can certainly charlie munger is not available to me but there will probably be other Charlie Mungers in my life that I can cultivate a relationship with them. I deserve to have relationships like that, and I will find them. But in observing Monish's close relationship with Charlie Munger, when Charlie Munger decides that you're his friend and Monish is his friend, he builds you up. And one of the one most wonderful gifts we can give our friends is a sense of confidence that they're okay and they're doing okay in the world and they, they're making intelligent choices. And I've seen Charlie do that, not just with Monish, but with a couple of other people that he and I know in common. What's my point to you? I appreciate your thanking me for putting maybe you and Monish on a pedestal, but I'm actually trying to um, channel something that I've seen in Charlie Mungo, which is, you actually are great and you're actually doing a spectacular job and you're doing a spectacular job of interviewing me and you're doing a spectacular job for the audience. And why shouldn't I give you that gift? <laughs> <laughs> but it comes from Charlie Mungo. So. And, and, and just like that, ladies and gentlemen, guy did it once more. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I didn't realize I was doing it. Sorry. <laughs> All right. guy. <laughs> So um, I'd like to transition to, into a new question. So yeah. in 1965, uh, accidentally the same year that Warren Buffett took over uh, the management of Berkshire Hathaway, the average tenure of companies in the S&P 500 was 33 years. By 1990, it was 20 years. And if you run some of the newer numbers, it might be as low as 14 years by 2026. Now, we all know that the mighty fall but as the tenure has become shorter and shorter, has it made you rethink how you identify and invest in compounders? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. It's a really good question that, you know, <laughs> Stig, I don't know the answer to that question, but that's not going to stop me from giving you an answer because I've got lots of training that has taught me to... to anyway, um, so two things come up for me. Uh, the one is perhaps flippant, but might not be, and the other is quite serious. Uh, I'll do the perhaps flippant point first. Um, just because the tenure of um, those top companies is becoming shorter and shorter, doesn't mean at the some that, that at some time it might not start becoming longer again. 
I mean, there's nothing that's saying that that is an inexorable, you know, that we can extrapolate that down to, you know, the tenure will be one year at a time. It's quite possible that we're at an inflection point now. And actually where it's going to go is that the tenure of the companies that are at the top of the S&P and the top of the return tables will still be there in 30 years. What we'll be tracing is a lengthening of that tenure. That's possible. We cannot rule it out. Absolutely cannot rule it out. If you ask me if that's the case, I think I tend to agree with what you probably think, which is that it's not the case, but I just want to set it up there as a possibility. Because if that is the possibility, because what your point implies is that just because a company is successful, even more than in the past, maybe in the past, if you bought the Nifty 50 and just stuck around, even if you'd bought it in the 70s, you'd do fine. But that's even that's way less true today, is I think your point. And I think I tend to agree with it, even though I set up the other point that maybe actually is going to become more true. And then then I would say, yes, I think that's probably true. And what that means is that, you know, our, you know, our, those of us who are investing, uh, who are not the level of wealth of Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Warren Buffett, and others, are not going to do particularly well if we buy the already top companies. And we need to have a good strategy for identifying the future leaders. And it actually puts a, you know, it's kind of like screaming at us in the face. What that statement of yours says to me is, Guy, if you, all you're doing is looking at the leaders in the S&P, or other kinds of leaders, you've already missed the boat more than ever before, more than in the nifty 50 times or other times. And you've got to start finding those uh, future um, champions that have not been uncovered by the world that have a good chance of displacing the current companies. And I think that that's probably right. And, and I think that I'm coming to the slow and unfortunate and reluctant realization that that's the case. And, um, and, you know, so a project that we have going on here is, and it comes from partly from uh, and, um, some talks that I've heard uh, from some incredible investors that I will refer to you because they should come on your show. In part, it was from listening to this Charlie Munger talk when Charlie says, I, I realized, Stig, that Sequoia Fund, Andreessen Horowitz, perhaps Index Ventures in Europe, four or five other of those top VC firms, the concentration of talent, insight, future returns that are emerging out of those firms. I mean, Charlie Munger said it. it it's it's, it's, it's uh, unprecedented historically that they're concentrated in such a small area. So what's my job? My job is not to, to keep looking anywhere but where those VC firms are. Instead, my job is to really try and understand the thinking of these incredibly smart people who are at these VC firms to try and understand how they see the world, why are they including certain investment themes, including crypto, in their investment strategies, why they are including excluding other investment themes, because it's very likely that those future champions are going to come from somewhere in and around that stable of people and companies. So, Guy, in continuation of that, uh, because you are an active investor, and we have so many listeners in the audience who are active investors, and we can't help but but pay attention to all the all the broader lines that might be changing around us, and perhaps our framework will will ultimately be changed as a result of that. Um, I can't help but ask: Is it advantageous for active investors like you that more and more money is poured into passive indexing? No. <laughs> I mean, um, uh, so so first of all, it is a very so so in terms of those of us, and I have many friends who still want to attract inbound investment from people who have excess capital. Uh, increasingly, those people, even more than ever before, they can say, you know, I really think that I I should just go with a passive strategy. There's so much that makes sense in a passive strategy. So that's one thing. The other thing is that those passive strategies drive up the valuations or drive up the amount of capital available to some of the most successful companies and some of the best businesses. So that, yeah, I think that um, that does not make business any easier for me. And I just have to repeat, which I'll probably repeat a couple of times more in this conversation, 
as Charlie Munger said, nobody said it's supposed to be easy. And I don't think that, you know, ideally we want everybody hating equities and we want money flowing to anywhere but equities. Instead, we have the opposite. And um, if I had something that I knew how to do better, or if I could identify better places to invest money, then I would certainly be figuring that out. But I, but I still think that the place where we're most protected from future inflation or current inflation, uh, the pace where we're most likely to grow our wealth over the long term is to be committed to equities. And guess what? All the passive funds and all the people investing in passive funds have figured, or passive equity funds have figured that out as well. And um, I guess maybe another thing to say is it just shouldn't be surprising if you figured something out that's intelligent. Why do you expect the rest of the world not to figure it out? Of course, they're going to figure it out, you know? Uh, and I, what it does say is, you know, I mean, I, so, so going back to Ronaldinho for a second, um, what, I, what I find so fascinating, and I'd really not tuned into it, is how, you know, these guys who are just so amazing with their ball skills, they, they do it by doing the unexpected. It's always the unexpected. And so how do you practice, practice the, unexpected? the unexpected? You have a you range have a of moves, and they seem to have an endless range of moves that create the unexpected for the defenders who are trying to beat them. And, you know, in this very difficult world, we're looking for the unexpected. We're looking for the unusual. And I think that in spite of all the money coming from index funds and all the commitment to equities and all the high valuations, if you study hard enough and you're persistent enough, eventually you'll you'll – find something unusual. I love the idea that, you know, Eskimos, apparently, I don't speak any Eskimo languages, have 30, 30 words for the, name, for the name of snow, because you have dry snow, wet snow, cold snow, you know, yeah. driven snow, snow yeah. that's packed. And I don't know, there's probably very few words for the name of snow in English. And so to the untrained eye, snow just looks like snow. To the Eskimo snow eye, snow is, comes in very, very different forms. And so same with investing. Even if you look at high-quality businesses, the more you look at them, every now and then you're going to find anomalies. And it's those anomalies that you want to check out on. And hopefully every now and then the anomaly is going to generate an investable idea. And I have a suspicion that most of the time today, given the environment, the investable ideas, the good investment ideas are going to look very expensive to the untrained eye. And it's only the person who's done the work to understand that actually they're very cheap. And that is not easy work to do. And inevitably, every now and then, a soft bank is going to say that WeWork is, is very cheap, but it actually, and, and it's got many, many ways to grow and to multiply their investors' capital. It's going to turn out to be a dud, you know? So I think something that, um, Somebody said, I don't remember who it was, but it was very compelling to me, was the idea that, you know, and here's a different way of looking at the kind of like died in the wool valley investors praying at the Church of Warren and Charlie is that those of us who pray at the Church of Warren and Charlie are looking for something that's a 95% bet. But actually in the, it was Ninad Shinde in the, I'm going to, I'm going to interview him for my little, little mini podcast over here. Um, Ninad. He said, actually, none of these things that he was talking about, he's a participant in Value X, are 95% bets. But they're all 70% bets. And 70% is pretty damn good. And stop expecting 95%. If you expect 95% likelihood of success, you're narrowing your universe down too much. And 70% bets is not still not kind of venture capital only 1 in 20 work out. It means that you know more than 1 in 2 works out, but not you know, not nine out of 10. And actually, if you have more than one and two and they work out hugely, you're still going to do extraordinarily well. So, Guy, now, now that we talk about uh, active investing, um, I can't help but ask you, if, if you could choose to expand your circle of competence and be an expert in a split second. So this is a very theoretical question. Uh, but you could you could uh, be an expert, just like um, just like that in a given sector, technology, country, whatever it might be. Uh, where would you add to your circle of competence? Yeah, uh, very easy to, for me to answer that, Stig. I'd like to have talked to and understood the business models of every single one of Sequoia's, Anderson Horowitz, 
uh, Index Ventures and uh, NFX, James Curry's investment firm. I would have wanted to have looked through and understood all of those. And I think that, you know, I have a friend who's a Google engineer who doesn't have that experience, but I think that he has a deep insight into many of those companies' investments. And so that is where I'd want to expand my area of knowledge. And I think that to the extent that you haven't, I urge you, Stig, and Preston, I actually bet that you have many times, but anybody who hasn't, find your way to University Avenue in Palo Alto. And I think that what, you know, there's a, I think there's a cafe called the Blue Bottle Cafe, which is just a hive of activity. And I think that what was so kind of shockingly interesting to me is how the conversations taking place there are not um, how do we take over the tech world? It's how do we, as people in the tech world, take over the planet? So that, so, you know, software, uh, basically expressing the idea of software is eating the world. Um, Silicon Valley, which is no longer just Silicon Valley, it's Houston, it's Tel Aviv, uh, sorry, it's Austin, Texas, it's Tel Aviv, it's many different places, really has the world as in, in its sights. And I guess it's, 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 um, it's summarized by this idea of disrupt everything. Everything is getting disrupted, and it's getting disrupted by technology. It's getting disrupted by very, very bright people sitting in that area. And so, you know, if I could go back 25 years, uh, the, I would want to avariciously grab all of that insight and knowledge. And if I didn't have a family and ties and all sorts of other things, I think I would. And I and all I cared about was generating the best financial investment results. I think that I would commit myself to spending a lot of time in that area, attending conferences, meeting CEOs, understanding what was going on. Very, very simple. And I think that if you did a poll of, of, your, of, your, of the audience, and if I did a poll of, for example, my attendees of ValueX, I think they'd all say the same thing. Yeah, I, I think you're, you're right. Um, so let's see if we can tie uh, business and life uh, in together uh, here with the next question. Before you investing, I know that you're increasingly asking yourself, uh, does the company have a noble mission to make society better off? Yeah. I feel it's it's a very profound question you're asking. Um, so could you please, uh, together with the audience, uh, walk us th through your train of thought on this and and why operating metrics like, say, return on capital and highest margins, which is, of course, still important metrics, but they're no longer your main focus. Yeah, I mean, it's possible that every company that earns a very high return on capital or has high margins is actually ripping somebody off. We just we just have to identify who it is. And maybe companies like Costco that actually earn super low margins are the ones that are not ripping people off. And um, I think it's a rule. If you cheat on your taxes year in, year out, sooner or later they're going to find you and sooner or later they're going to ding you. So don't do it. Uh, and uh, you might, you know, you might be able to save more from the tax man one year to the next. And this kind of like, uh, it's kind of seems to me to be a universal rule uh, that um, if you're kind of drawing more from your environment than you give, then sooner or later, sooner or later, it's going to catch up with you. It seems. I don't think that people get that kind of like free pass or that get that easy pass forever. And and then we go into the personal domain. And, and again, you know, the source of so much wisdom is Charlie Munger. And I just love this. And I, I'm certain that he gets this from talking to his grandchildren. The best way to get successful is to deserve it. You know, and it's this beautiful idea that don't worry about how the universe will reward you. It will reward you if you really deserve that success. And, you know, you want to, when you, if, if and when you get that success, you want people to say, well, he really deserves it. Or, and, and then I think that you can extend that straight to companies. So I think that if you were somebody who loved Philip Morris's profitability, the enormous cash flow generation they had, but you uh, did not take into account the fact that they were giving people cancer, you were sitting with a giant unrecognized liability that sooner or later society might take it upon itself to make you pay for all the people that you're giving cancer to. And there was a tobacco settlement in which effectively they did that. And they kind of like those companies' profitability was se severely impacted. I used to have a fascination with the for-profit education sector. And um, 
they had the opportunity for endless growth and they had a strong incentive to restrict on their investments in facilities like libraries and sports fields and student dorms and the like. And, um, but they were enormously profitable and I was very, very enamored with the profitability, of course. But then the Obama administration came along in the United States and dinged them. And then, you know, not so long later, uh, the Brazilian uh, political system made it very, very hard for for profit education companies to really be as profitable as they had been. And then we have the most recent kind of, um, I you could call it a disaster for P investors in the sector in China. And so how do you avoid those kinds of risks? And this concept of a noble mission is the ultimate way to avoid those kinds of risks. Why does why does Elon Musk get, I, I don't want to say he gets a free pass, but I think that many people would say that he gets a free pass for the Chinese because he's actually on a noble mission. He's one of the most incredible noble missions, what one thinks of Tesla or of his, as him as an investment partner. So getting your noble mission, both as an individual and as a company, is one of the kind of surefire ways to both get you on the path to success and to, um, uh, to mitigate many, many risks. We can't, we're not going to mitigate risk by reading the risk factors in the 10K, although I'm not saying don't read it. That's what a narrow minded lawyer decided was going to remove liability for you if these risk risk factors, factors are mentioned. But that, and, and no amount of intelligence and creative thinking and good analysis is going to enable the analyst or the investor to foresee all the risks in the business. And so if you're not gonna be able to foresee all the risks and the risk factors in the 10Q don't help, what can you do? And I think that uh, if you have a moral mission, then you're gonna use that as your a, a good foot forward when you come into adversity. And not that people will give that company that has that noble mission a free pass, but they're far more likely to want to engage with it productively. And by the way, that's why when I talked about charitable donations in, in my little investment uh, firm here, um, in a certain way, it's long-term greedy. To be an investor in your community, for example, is actually just uh, you know, ensuring your survival over the years. So uh, let me just uh, get back to one of the things you said there um, about deserving success. I think it's I think it's very insightful. Um, one of the things I remember reading from Warren Buffett uh, whenever uh, I was younger was how do you get a good spouse, which is something I think a lot of young men are interested in. And and the advice was pretty simple, uh, be a good spouse. And it's it might sound silly because it's so simple, but it's so profound in all walks of life to to think like that. You know, I've been I've been married 11 years and of course, whenever my wife and I have disagreements, it's never my fault. It's it's always her fault. But of course, uh, you know how this guy. <laughs> and I, I just want to tell you what what's your wife's name, Stig? Sophie. Sophie, if you listen to this, I just want you to know in any dispute with Stig, I'm on your side. Right. <laughs> yes. It's been it's been ordained by Guy now. I can, <laughs> I can tell that to, to Sophie. But it it is um it's it's such a it's such a valuable thing to think of whenever um Whenever you become emotional, like emotions run high, something is going on, stop and ask yourself, why do I deserve this? And um, and again, it doesn't it doesn't happen for guy guy and me when we have disagreements with our wives, but it's something as simple as that would just tell you how how often you can stop yourself and be like, oh, I I deserve this. What my what my spouse said to me, that that is well deserved. Um, which can be really, really hard to to see in the moment, of course. I, you know, I, just so you know, I think that, that especially in our worst arguments, my wife has certainly accused me of things that I, I feel like I don't deserve. But on the other side, though, I think that when I, in my marriage, and, 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 and I can't say I've done it as much as I could have, and I can't say that I've done it as, as recent, you know, I didn't, I, I should have just started doing this a lot earlier, but... To wake up and ask the question, how do I be the best husband, husband to my wife? So in our case, I'll just, you know, we got this place in the mountains to go skiing in. No, they, they, and, and, you know, 
uh, I did not want to spend money on the kitchen because I thought it was ridiculous because we had a perfectly decent kitchen. And, um, and then, you know, I, I kind of like somewhere those thoughts of Charlie Munger percolated in. How do I be a good husband? She wants a good kitchen. If you can afford it, give her a good kitchen, you know, and sort of like, and then I discovered that by looking to see what my wife wanted and finding a way to get it to her uh, made me a lot happier, a lot happier and made my marriage a lot happier. So that idea of how do I make it so that my wife feels like I'm a good husband? What does she want? You know, I, one of the big things my wife wants is just show up on time for dinner and be attentive to the children. You know, <laughs> it's pretty basic, <laughs> but, but, you know, and, and, and you think that she should be able to take that for granted and you think that I should give that for granted. But in my case, that actually takes uh, a little bit of thoughtfulness and positive effort. But, you know, um, yeah, I don't know. I, if, if your worst arguments are anything like my worst arguments, I don't think that I deserve every single thing, that my <laughs> wife, every single epithet that my wife has hurled at me, for sure. So. <laughs> no. Uh, who, who knows? Uh, if, I, if I run into Laurie, I would, I would make sure to, to tell her to side with you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> favor. Yeah, I have, there's this lovely thought that I don't know where it comes from, or I can't remember where it comes from. And I don't know if it's, you know, I, th I do think it was describing Mexican women, but you can probably ex extend it to, to all women that, and may, that they give you more of what you give them. So, you know, if, if, if you give them, if you give them your physical love, they give you children. If you give you, they give you your emotional love, they create a spiritual home for you. If you give them a home, they give you friends and family, you know, there's kind of a multiplier effect there that is, uh, I think I think true of what so many women do, and it's kind of like, and I'm kind of, I said this, nothing I'm saying to you I haven't said to my wife, I feel slightly ashamed that I was a person who did not understand that I just needed to give her more resources with which to create a beautiful life around us. And uh, I'm extraordinarily grateful to her. She's... She's, I feel very lucky to be married to her. Laurie, if you're listening to this, I love you. <laughs> she oh. likes hearing that. <laughs> yeah, I can understand why. You know, and, and there, there's this wonderful, wonderful quote. And I, I know I've been, this interview had been like a high, highlights of, of, of quotes. <laughs> um, pain plus reflection equals progress. And um, it, it's Red Dahlia's quote. And it's, yes. it, it's probably true both for, for for marriage uh, and investing, I think I think that pain plus reflection, it's easier to do in a parcel sense because you only got yourself to deal with, and so. But but this idea of pain plus reflection is if you take the pain and you sweep it under the rug, you're not going to get much benefit out of it. It's that ability to take the pain and stick it in the back seat of the car with you and take it on a drive with you and just kind of like let it let it smolder there and learn the lessons of it. I think that the with the minute you become a couple of husband and wife, that becomes more challenging. I think it's a bit more like perhaps riding a bicycle because you have to process that pain, the two of you. And of course, processing pain in a couple is uh, fraught with dangers. Like you might accuse one member of the couple might accuse the other of being the cause of the pain. And you, and, and I think that sort of figuring out what part of this pain is my do i own in this what part of the pain or causation do you own what part of it is the external environment that that, that we, we can't influence that is really really complex but i can tell you that to the extent that my wife and i have succeeded at any point in our lives in that program in that process i think it's one of the most rewarding things that i've done actually and i would tell you stig with teenage children that process and we have three it becomes ever so more complicated because you got so many more personalities to deal with through in different places and thinking different things so so guy speaking with you uh, on and off uh this this interview reading your book and and watching you on different platforms you you come across as so authentic and so and so genuine. Um, 
which I think is is very hard for a lot of us to to make ourselves vulnerable um uh, the same way. Um I remember speaking with um with Jesse Isler uh years back and uh here here also on on this show uh and Jesse Isler he is um he he made an he created an airline and founded it and sold it to Buffett but I don't know if he's he might be even slightly more famous for being married to Sarah Blakely uh to today a, a wonderful person and 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 so is his uh wife and I asked him about a piece of advice he would give to his 20 year old self and rather you know he, he said you know it's, it's it's very simple make yourself vulnerable that was the best piece of advice he could he could give so and I, I know it's um I know it's a big question to ask you here uh guy could you talk about your own journey about making yourself vulnerable making the decision to make yourself vulnerable also in public and perhaps some of the bruises but also some of the wonders that it has carried with it yeah what a what an amazing question i didn't i don't i i have not met sarah blakely uh i share a mutual friend with her and um i never heard of jesse itzler uh but and i'd never heard of somebody who's well known and successful in saying make yourself vulnerable and um, but it, you know you've kind of in a some sense thrown me back because it's it's such a powerful idea and um and so you know so simple to describe and so hard to do and because because if so i think that probably i know very little about jesse other than his name and that he said that i i suspect stig that he is or was deeply loved by his parents and or is deeply loved and it, meaning that he has no doubt in, in no doubt that he doesn't even it's not even a question that he asked that he is he he is loved and that he loves himself the reason why i say that is that what gives us the strength to be vulnerable is i think the knowledge that when we become strawberry jam on the mass pike type of deal when 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 life hits us sideways and feels like we've been destroyed we have the confidence to go out and conquer even though we know that we're going to be dealt terrible terrible setbacks and um and and what a what a so that's it's just a i i'm kind of like in awe of the power of that insight and uh then i asked myself so i'm going to go better to um how i've dealt with vulnerability how i got to make myself more, more vulnerable and um you know maybe some learnings from that and um you've really kind of stumped me in a certain way stumped in a good way because you've just thrown this it's kind of a new thought to me that shouldn't be that new to me i as you were talking what came up for me was brene brown and um uh she has talked a lot about i think the power of vulnerability and in my case it starts with having somebody who loves you deeply no matter what and i think that if many of us some of us are lucky enough to have gotten that from our parents and if we didn't get it from our parents hopefully we had a soccer coach or you know maybe now a spouse or a significant other who provides that uh force for us if we don't have that we don't have something to go back to when life splats us in the face the next thing i think that i go to idea that i go to is when we are so so somebody is listening to this or i myself say to myself i need to make myself vulnerable i think that we need to titrate the vulnerability so there are many different levels of vulnerable there is standing out in the snow there's putting on your skis and just standing in your skis there's going out in the snow and pointing your skis down the steepest slope in history all of those are different levels of vulnerability and they're sitting inside in the warmth and not even putting your skis on and so you know i think that this sort of in injunction to be vulnerable and make yourself vulnerable to get success it's saying get outside and think about putting your skis on 
but it's not telling you where to point the skis. It's not telling you whether you should ski the, the blue slope, the red slope, or the black slope. And so vulnerable is not on or off. And um, if you're a type that is very scared of making yourself vulnerable, make yourself a little bit vulnerable. And if you're already making yourself vulnerable, check if you're not, you shouldn't make yourself more or less vulnerable. So um, I think that uh, in, in many ways, I would tell you, I mean, the opposite perhaps of making yourself vulnerable is sort of like staying in shelter out of fear. And I actually think that there are many aspects of my life, Stig, that actually have been driven by fear. I don't think that's a good thing. Uh, I think that uh, fear does not help you get anywhere in life. Fear is a kind of uh, not a helpful emotion. I think that fear is a helpful emotion when there's something to be scared of, you know? So if the avalanche is coming down the hill, then definitely be fearful. If you're walking down a dark alleyway and there's a guy in the corner with a knife, definitely be fearful. But to be um, uh, chicken little and to be worried that the sky is going to fall on your head when actually it may never fall, that emotion is very unhelpful. And I think that my example perhaps demonstrates that you can live actually quite a fearful life. And when I say fearful, that's been expressed in some very conservative investing, uh, an unwillingness to take huge, huge, um, huge risks for gain or even small risks for gain. But the answer is that even if you do a little bit right, you can have some, you can have a pretty damn good life and enjoy a certain amount of success. And I do think that the, some, the success that I have had is not because I came out of a place of fear. It's because I came out of a place of being will, willing to be vulnerable, willing to fail. Um, and then I guess uh, I will just take you to the writing of the first chapter of my book. And so vulnerability comes with this desire of honesty. And I was very heavily influenced by two books. Both of them came to me by way of uh, Monish Pabra and this amazing lunch that I had with him. Uh, one is Power Versus Force by David Hawkins. Um, the other is Mahatma Gandhi's bio autobiography. Uh, and this Power Versus Force, David Hawkins talks about the power of being truthful and the power of authenticity. And so, you know, authenticity is not some cute thing that you do to make the world like you because you're being authentic. Authenticity is power. It is power because people pay attention to authenticity. You know, a leader who is facing some enormously difficult task that he or she is trying to lead people in, who stands up and says, I'm afraid. That's authenticity, which leads people because now they say, that person is afraid. I'm afraid. I'm going to listen because they, they're identifying with the emotion that I have. And then maybe they say, I'm afraid. Here's what I'm doing about it is far better and real leadership than saying, don't be afraid, you idiots. When everyone's thinking, yeah, 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 easy for you to say, I'm absolutely very, very scared. So um, as I was writing the first chapter of the book, I understood the power of authenticity. I understood the power of truth. And I had seen that Mahatma Gandhi had written about going with prostitutes and about um, eating meat despite being a divide Hindu. And I had an issue that I wanted to work out. I had this terrible career choice that I'd made that I kind of wanted to keep buried for the rest of my life. And, but then there's something that happened on, I don't, first of all, I had to write about it, but I wrote about it telling myself, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. Maybe I'll just go into my notes. I'll never, I'll never look at them again. And then I don't know exactly what happened. I discovered that I had within me the courage to put it out there and deal with the consequences. And I think that actually I did something that, um, uh, his uh, four-hour work week guy. Um, why am I forgetting uh, his name? Tim Ferriss. Yeah, Tim Ferriss has a whole TED talk on fear mapping. And actually, what I had done was I had fear mapped the consequences of making myself vulnerable and telling the truth about that part of my career. And so I fear mapped it, and I said, well, what are the consequences of me going and doing this? And I... I figured out exactly the way Tim Ferriss said is that, you know, yeah. first of all, the worst outcomes were not that bad. Second of all, the worst outcomes were something that I could deal with. And there were also all these things that I could do to mitigate those risks. And my fear was that I'd be completely a pariah in the financial world because people would see this stuff 
And they just say, well, we're definitely not having anything to do with you, as I wrote about. And so that actually, that capacity that I discovered to make myself vulnerable in the moment when I realized that that chapter was going to form a part of my book, I think set me on a fantastic path. And I'm really saying this not to teach, but to just to act as a witness to one example of that is that the decision to make oneself vulnerable, I think I want to reassure the listener, that decision is not something that is forced on us. It's not like some part of my superego says, you need to make yourself vulnerable, so now go and do it, as if it's some schoolmaster. It, it's something that wells up from inside. When the, teacher, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. So I think that the injunction, going back to Jesse Itzler about success being uh, vulnerability being at the root of success it's not about okay let me select one of 10 ways i can make myself vulnerable and, and find one that would is really kind of out there it's about you know so so there's a so when i when i don't have anything better to do stig i read poetry i try to read poetry and there's this poet t.s Eliot, who is um I don't understand most of his poetry, just to be clear, and I'm not some literary guy who understands everything. But there's a poem of his called The Love Song of Sir Alfred Prufrock. And then I want to go and say, Stig, that I don't understand the poem. But the poem evokes thoughts and feelings in me. And so um, there is a part of the poem where he says, do I, don't I, do I dare to ask the question? to ask that question, and I'm not quoting the poem entirely correctly, but he evokes this idea of a guy who's on the very tip of doing something. He's on the very tip of asking perhaps a woman in his life whether she should marry him, although it's not clear that that's what the poem is about. But he says, just on the cusp of, you know, you have the person standing in front of that, on that cliff, and will he or won't he jump? with the bungee jump, or will he, won't he, is he ready to take that leap into the unknown? And I think that there's an instinctive sense that we need to get around or get better at to say, yes, I'm never going to feel entirely safe, but this is something where I'm willing to make myself vulnerable. And you know, we got to try and try, we got, we got to try and titrate the doses of vulnerability we give to ourselves shouldn't be so little that it doesn't have an impact. It shouldn't be so great that it could destroy ourselves. We're going to get it wrong, but what an amazing thought. And I've rambled a little bit, but uh, you've given me something really to chew on. I mean, that's gonna, I'm going to probably dream about vulnerability now. I do apologize to that. Uh... No worries. It was a, <laughs> no, don't apologize. Thank you. Um, it's a you know the best questions make you think and and God I got I I could I could write essays on that. Well, th thank you, uh, guy. It, it, if I can say you know I as we're rounding off the interview, I, I know you've been very generous with your time. Uh, I, I feel with you like like I do with Warren Buffett that you know, I originally found you because I wanted to learn to invest. And, and while you and, and, and Warren uh, Buffett are among the very best when it comes to investing, what really stays with me are the, are the life lessons. So so I just wanted to say thank you for that guy. Yeah, you're putting me on a pedestal now. So just let, let the record show that it wasn't just me putting Stig and Preston on a pedestal. It goes both ways. Um, and how kind you put me on a pedestal there with Warren Buffett. It's it's I, I think it's a it's a stretch to say that I am a great investor like Warren Buffett, but I really appreciate the attempt. And um, I mean, what what I got to is that I saw all these people, especially in New York, who looked like they wanted to be the richest, and they were playing the game in order to be the richest. And I struggled with that idea because obviously it's an outward sign of success. But I also struggled the fact that it was asinine because, um, you know, how much did the rich man leave when he went to his grave? All of it. And, um, you know, there's this, this idea, well, the, the cave you fear, to, you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek is, I think, a Confucian saying, perhaps. Um, but when you go on an adventure, and life is an adventure with many small sub-adventures in it, 
you get the treasure, but actually what what is the most valuable is the is the is the journey that you got and the lessons that you learned along the way. And um I'm more than halfway through my life. So, you know, in seconds I'm no longer a billionaire and have no chance of being a second billionaire unless Ray Kurzweil and the Singularity University New Health stuff somehow extend our lifespans by another hundred years or two hundred years. But I, I don't I'm not I don't believe I mean I guess I'm a skeptic that that's going to happen in my lifetime. I, I know that I've been proven wrong in so many things and maybe in that as well. Um, but in a certain way, would you not agree that if we don't devote ourselves to enriching ourselves, not through the material wealth, but through the life lessons, then we're actually throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We're, we're, we're getting rid of the most valuable part. And I'm going to, um, I pause because I kind of really want to mention his name, but I'm not going to mention his name. I was in a bachelor party or kind of a bachelor dinner for a guy who at the time was already a billionaire and is now a billionaire many times over. And I found him, it was, it was, he was a friend of a friend. It was in a place in New York city. And I found this person to be an utterly shallow uninteresting person to be around not somebody that i would have wanted as a friend and he was somebody who was extraordinarily focused on just the money and he just wanted a very very big number to his name and he'd figured a way how to do it and uh you know i felt miserable around him i really did and so that is not the way you want to live your life but hanging out with stig and Prash, figuring <laughs> Preston, figuring out wisdom for the world. That is freaking awesome. Wow. <laughs> well, th thank you for, for saying so. If if I can, w without it being too much of a, of a bromance, because I, I, before we round off the interview, I would I would like to give you an opportunity where, where the audience can learn more about you. But before we get to that, you know, I, we, we talked about the education of a value investor many times here on the show, which is a wonderful book. And I guess... I guess I would like to put a few words to that for uh, for the listeners out there because the the journey I was I was personally on at the time uh, was in some way similar to to, to guys uh, in what you did with at DS Blair uh, and and I think I think you I think you you described it as uh, the Wolf of Wall Street even though that in that movie they just turned the volume up a, a bit compared to to the environment you're in but it was a very toxic environment and what I the reason why I'm mentioning it and was uh, it happened to me simultaneously uh, for me, but I've met so many, so many people in the community who are fascinated by money or you know, that life, what they see, then they get, they get into it and they realize what a horrible world it is with shallow, greedy, terrible people, truly. And they wanted to get out of it. And that they they realize that it's not mutually exclusive to wanting to be successful, wanting to make money, but still be a good person and do do good in the world. And I think that's that's one of the reasons why so many people are drawn to your to your book and 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 learning from you, guy. So oh, yeah. have, having said that, um, can I send it over to you and 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 give a handoff to where people can learn more about you? I'm sure after this conversation, people would like to 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 get to know you even even more. Yeah, thank oh, you, thank and you. and. Writing that book was the beginning of the most wonderful adventure and journey for me that obviously I'm still on. I should say that I, I think I, I was, you know, I, I did genuinely share valuable knowledge in the book. But I think that, you know, my career as somebody who can share, uh, make a positive impact on the world, to just use a kind of a phrase that seems to be around a lot. I mean, I'm at the very beginnings and I'm just scratching the surface. So, I got a lot more to go and just to be clear you know it's i'm i'm not doing it out of some sense of complete altruism it's fun and i get so much reward and benefit from it and so and and i really do think that there are people who figured these things out way better well, than well, i many of these many things way better than i have but i'm on a path um you know uh, uh i do like twitter uh i did a course on twitter uh, just a not of course, I just did a watched a few videos and learned quite a bit from a guy called Matt Kobach and David Perel on how to use Twitter well. 
And so you can find me on Twitter and I do respond. And I love Twitter as a, as a, as a serendipity machine. And um, what I learned very briefly, Stig, in a thousand different ways, be authentic, don't use links, don't post too many images, and very aggressively mute or block people who are toxic. So when you, even though the people, you know, just get all of that out and it's a tiny corner of Twitter that's really wonderful, but G Spear, you're welcome to find me on Twitter. Um, I work quite hard at an email newsletter, again, inspired by David Perel, uh, because I think that, and, and, and the idea, Stig, that I'm going to pause and express because I think it's so powerful is if we just browse the internet or, or hang out on YouTube, we are the product and the algorithm is using us. But the minute we create content of one form or another and put it out there, we can use the algorithm to connect to, connect to other people who have our very specific form of crazy. <laughs> so um, I write an email newsletter and I have a podcast, very small podcast. I do it just for fun and just to interview people that I might not be able to otherwise interview and to kind of shine a spotlight on people I want to shine a spotlight on. It is a fraction of the audience of the Investors Podcast, but it's kind of like a hobby that kind of supports my desire for a rich and fulfilled life. And so you're extremely welcome to find that podcast. I hope you like some of the conversations I've had on it. I would also share that Stig is and Preston are incredible interviewers. Uh, and I really should tell you that the plan that uh, the, the research that Stig put into this interview is something that I hope to replicate in some of the future interviews that I do. But if you go to guyspear.com, www.guyspear.com, you can find the podcast and you can also get the opportunity to um, subscribe to my newsletter. I would tell you that I am um, prohibited by various regulatory authorities by talking about talking about the fund that I manage. But if you find your way to those two places, you will certainly find the, your way to the fund that I manage. I would tell you that, um, you know, you, they, there are all sorts of hoops that you have to jump through if you ever decided that you wanted to invest. I, if you feel like you're like-minded and you feel like you want some more of me in your life uh, and you're the right kind of person, I would be delighted to meet you. And I would say that, I could have run the fund that I run just for friends and family, but I love the associations that I've gotten to have. And some of the investors that I've gotten to know who invested with me are truly wonderful people. And I'm very grateful to have them as part of the fund. But, um, but yeah, uh, thank you so much for having me. And just remember, if people are disparaging an idea, it might actually be pretty good. And I hope that uh, Preston hears that in regards to his interest in crypto and your interest in cryptocurrencies. Wow, uh, Guy, uh, thank you, thank you so much for your uh, for your time. Um, it's it's absolutely amazing to to be able to learn directly from you. So so thank you for once again joining us here on the Investors Podcast. Uh, and thank you for having me. I have a sense that the Investors Podcast is going to go from strength to strength. You're a you're an incredible force for good yourselves, but I'll stop because then you're going to call me out for doing too much. I'm going, to, I'm going to call you out and send it back to you guy here at the end and say, if if that is indeed what's going to happen, it's because we speak to to people like you. Oh, so you I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can end the interview now. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you so much, guy. It's uh, it's been a, It's been a privilege speaking with you today. And thank you, Stig and Preston. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.